Nueva suerza 
Although I have no strength, I lift up my hands. Though I have many problems, when I lift up my hands, I begin to feel that hurts and makes me sing. When I lift up my We're appreciative that Brother Scott, yeah. Sister Scott's here. Please make yourself at home. Uh, testimony, songs, preaching, brother, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we're glad you're here. But most of all, we're glad that the Lord's here with us. Amen. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. And we want to be Spirit-led. And I thank God uh, for a hunger and a desire to do that. Uh, so as we sit back and wait on the Lord and Hopefully the Lord moves on brother and sister Scott and we really want whatever the Lord wants. We don't, we don't have our own motives, our own agendas. We really want what God wants. So we're thankful that you're here, brother. We're thankful that you're here, sister, and your sons. Please make yourself at home. Thank God. Um, I just want to share a few words. I'm not a good testimony person, but um, I am thankful to be here, and I'm thankful for Brother Shane Finnicum and his family to graciously opening their home and blessing us with just pouring of their love. Um, this church has always been in my mind of church of workers and I'm glad to see the work is still going on and last night's youth service was really really encouraging that it's going down the generations that they are seeking the Lord and they're desiring to get closer to the Lord digging into the words of God and that just really did something into my heart I felt really encouraged to be here and I felt really privileged to hear um, the song we just sang uh, reminded me of a testimony of a sister at my own assembly a few weeks ago. She's been dealing with certain issues like for a very long time, like years, years. It could be like almost her entire life. And every time it got worse and worse, I know the Lord gave her strength and helped her through. But it's been hard. It's, she's been still struggling with those things. And a few weeks ago, she was pressing into the Lord, praying and crying out. And us sisters were praying all together. And after that, she gave a testimony saying, I started praying and pressing in out of the obedience. And just like how the walls of the Jericho came down, through the obedience, she said she felt like the Lord took that burden out of her heart and placed it with just the word of Jesus. And that just gave me, I've been just, you know, meditating on that thought. And after that, Brother Lewis started telling us we need to get those walls of Jericho down by faithfully seeking the Lord daily. He mentioned something about how we cannot just take the manna and store it to use it later. We have to go out and gather it daily from the morning every day. We have to be diligent and faithful to seek the Lord. 
And he said, yes, we need to bring down the walls of the Jericho, but we have to build up the walls through our praise so that the enemies cannot come in. So that song, like when I lift up my hands, no matter how many problems we, we have, how many trials we have, because we know that the Lord is going to do something out of that. We are going through that experience, through the trials, because otherwise we cannot grow. We cannot build that relationship with the Lord. So with that faith, we just need to praise the Lord, build up that wall so that the, the enemies cannot get in. And I just really appreciate the song service, and I'm thankful to be here. Thankful to be here. Thank you, brother. Um, <clears throat> told Brother Puckett, we're, we've been taught to be obedient. <laughs> no pressure, right? <laughs> um, well, I'll start with a confession. Um, it may bring dismay to some, and it may bring relief to others. I'm no preacher. Um, I... Uh, but I do try to be uh, 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 as useful as I can. Um, I try to try to allow myself to be used in whatever way I can. Um, uh, so usually that's in music. Um, but I do uh, I do try to get to my feet and encourage the people uh, as much as I can, because um, we all want to be willing vessels, don't we? Um, that's what the Lord desires. He doesn't desire uh, education. He doesn't desire uh, great speaking ability. He doesn't really desire any musical talent. He just desires willing bodies, right? Uh, he desires a willing sacrifice. Um, uh, and I too, uh, as my wife was saying, I was I was just thinking as we were uh, in that song service. Well, before I say that, I just also want to say how thankful I am for the welcome that we've received here. Um, uh, as as Sister Scott was saying, this church has always um, had a, a heart. Uh, for hospitality, for serving, and I really appreciate that um, to me and my family. Um, and I too enjoyed the youth service last night. It's, it was wonderful. Um, we do, our, our youth are not quite old enough that we've gotten to that point yet where we can experience that at home. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience, and I wish that, that I had had that when I was young, um, that, that y'all did a wonderful job, um, and, uh, and, and it, was, it was just wonderful to see... Um, Y'all putting your heart into it, your your, and really preparing yourselves um, to to uh, to contribute to a service, um, uh, and that's something that we should all all have on our hearts for every service. It's not uh, only for a youth service. Um, no matter what position he's put us in a church, no matter what our gift is, I feel like we should be willing to be used in any capacity. Um, but but to get back to what I was saying, um, the Lord, I feel like the Lord. And we've talked about this um, has had us in somewhat of a season of praise in our church. Um, we went through a lot of things. Y'all all know about uh, Zachary Lewis and, and the leukemia that he went through, um, and how we lost um, uh, a, a whole family from our church for about six months uh, because they had to go to Cincinnati for treatments. Um, and, and that wasn't the only thing. There were a lot of other things that were going on, and so we went through this period where we were that the church was kind of, everybody was sort of going through something. And that's not unique. Um, every church has those periods, um, and everybody's going through something at, at some time. Uh, but we just went through a period where it felt like everybody was going through something. Um, but then as we were coming out of that, um, it felt like the Lord just impressed on us to go into a season of praise, um, to, to praise Him for, for the things that He had brought us through, to praise Him for the things that He was still bringing us through, and to praise Him for the things that He will bring us through. Um, because he, he desires our praise in every season. He desires our praise in every situation. Um, and so I just want to read a, a, a verse here in the Psalms. Uh, it's the safest book for a visitor to bring up in the Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> over in Psalm 73, I'll start in verse 23. 
It says, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. The Lord is always with us. No matter what we go through, he's always right there holding our hand, if we'll let him, if we won't pull ourselves away from him. Uh, as it says over there in John, he's holding us in his hand, and nobody can take us out of his hand. The only way we can get out of his hand is to walk out, right? Uh, but we don't want to do that. We want to stay close to the Lord. <clears throat> Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. There's nobody but Jesus. There's nobody that we need besides Jesus. He is our everything. <clears throat> my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And so no matter what we go through, no matter the, the trials, the temptations, the hard things that we go through, he is our strength whenever everything else fails. Um, there's another, another passage. Um, let me think. I think it's in Psalm 46. Yeah, Psalm 46. Um, uh, 4610 is quoted a lot, but I'll start in, in verse 1 is also quoted a lot. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. And so, though we go through things that make it feel like the earth is, is melting away, um, you know, it, it, that, that's very dramatic language there. He's, he's, not, uh, he's not just uh, talking about some small situation that came up. We're, we're talking about um, the earth being removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though everything around you is crumbling, um, and, and, you know, we, there, we can see over in, in Peter where it talks about the earth is going to melt as wax. Um, though we're going through those kind of situations, he's there. He's our strength. He's our refuge. He's where, who we can run to and be safe. And so I just want to stay close to him because no matter what, I just want to stay close to him. As we talk about all the time in, in Norfolk, I'm sure you all talk about it all the time here. We want to stay in the boat. You know, you, you, if you get out of the boat, you're not safe. No, but no matter what comes against that boat, if you stay in the boat, you're safe. And so I just want to stay close to the Lord. Um, like I said, I'm not a preacher, um, but I am. I, I have uh, sung a few times in my life. So if, if Sister Scott can come up, I think I'll try to sing a song. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> you want me to take this off or just sing with this? Okay. <laughs> I searched around but never found the peace and joy that does surround me when I am walking close to the Lord. No other thing that I can find can satisfy, give peace of mind, like no
and I have burdens that I can't bear. I go to Him, I know He'll be there. Only He can lift me up when I am down. And He supplies all of my needs, and I know over me when I am walking close to the Lord, walking close to the Lord is my desire. joy, no peace I have found, for I'm going where the sun always shines, and one day soon He's coming for me, His blessed face I'm longing to
watch over me when I Appreciate that. It was a blessing in your words and psalms there. And Sister Scott, your testimony is encouraging. Appreciate what the Lord's doing. And we really are thankful you're here. Um, we're thankful you came this way to bless us this morning and last night and with the instruments. Uh, we appreciate that. that you came this way to be with us. And I'm thankful for what the Lord's doing, church. I tell you, the uh, burden of the Lord is strong and the burden of the church is great and no one can bear it on their own. We need the Lord and uh, we yoke up with Him, the burden's light. Uh, so this morning I want to uh, share something with you I think the Lord has for us. Um, it's old over in the Old Testament, 2 Kings. Uh, uh, praying and seeking the Lord and you know, I've, I've read this story before. I've heard this story. Uh, uh, we've Some of the young kids have watched little videos about it. Uh, some of us that are in here haven't read it, don't even know it. Um, but there's so much in this story that I've never really seen it before, so I started digging into it and um, tearing it down a little bit and peeling back the details because it makes for a really good story um, of faith and a really good story 
for what God can do. But we're going to start in 2 Kings 5, and we're going to talk about Naaman for a little while. Uh, it's a good story. Uh, there's so much in this chapter. There's so much wealth in this chapter we can get because it says so many things in here. It's not just a generic story of a man of God and a, a, a um, um, warrior, a captain of uh, Syria's army. There's a lot in this story, and I hope that when I sit down, you get a lot more out of it than you had. Uh, but we're going to launch into verse 1 because Naaman was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. So we're going to talk about Naaman this morning. Because there were some things Naaman needed from God. Naaman didn't know what he needed from God. I'll tell you, he had an idea what he thought he needed from God. But come the end of the story, Naaman got a whole lot more than he bargained for. Thank God he got a lot more than he bargained for in this story. And I tell you, sometimes when we come to the Lord, we come to the Lord thinking we know what we need, but we get a whole lot more than we bargained for. You know, we actually got more than we wanted. Um, I remember when I came here 20 some years ago, uh, I really just came for a wife. It's just a fact. But I'll tell you something, I got a whole lot more than I bargained for. <laughs> Don't you feel that way? You've gotten a whole lot more than you bargained for? <laughs> Maybe you thought you were just going to stop in for a stint just to get something mad, but you came out with a whole lot more. And here Naaman was the captain of uh, the king of Syria's army. He was a well-known man to the earth. Let me tell you something, Naaman wasn't no little guy. Naaman was a, what we would call in the world today a big dog. Naaman was a big dog. and uh, Naaman was a man of valor. It says, he goes on, he says, he was a great man. Naaman was a great man. I know I came here... Uh, when you, you know, have you ever come to the church thinking you're something? You ever done that? You ever, when you first met the Lord or met this people, you thought you were something? Uh, until you realize you really weren't much at all. Uh, matter of fact, he tells you you were the weak and beggarly elements of the earth, is what he tells us. Uh, and he says, he goes on, he says, he was a great man with his master and honorable. And he was an honorable man. He had a lot going for him. This Naaman had a lot going for him. <laughs> How many times have we thought we have a lot going for us in the natural? We have a lot going for us. And he says, he goes, because by him the Lord hath given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man. Naaman was a mighty man, but Naaman had a problem. Last few words of that verse says, but he was a leper. Now you got to understand what this meant for Naaman. Number one, all sin comes little at a time. It comes at little, it starts little. It starts little. For Naaman here, it was a little spot on his skin. Probably didn't think much about it. Maybe he wrote it off as a battle wound. Maybe something nicked him. He didn't know. Maybe it was a sore. Maybe it was a cut. He didn't know. It started off little in his life. But see, that's how sin does it. Sin starts off little. Sin doesn't stay little. Sin continued doesn't stay little. To understand now, for the first time, Naaman's standing in front of the mirror and he sees a couple spots. No, no. And you got to understand what that meant for Naaman. You go back to the few verses we read, he was a great man, an honorable man, a noble man, a mighty man. Understand now he's being overshadowed by his leprosy all of a sudden. It was going to take everything from him. That little bit of leprosy Naaman noticed was he was standing in the risk of losing everything he ever had worth anything to him. Now, don't you think about that. Sin. Sin in our lives, we stand to lose everything 
God has for us just by a little bit of sin. And Naaman was worried. I'm going to tell you, Naaman was fearful. I'll tell you why here in a little bit. Naaman would have done anything, anything to keep what he had accomplished. Anything. He goes on, he says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, I know in this story there's a lot of spiritual types and things we can say, and we're not going to get into all that. I want to just give you the basic of the story. There are some types I'm going to give you, but this is a real story. This really happened. Sometimes we get caught up in types and shadows and forget there was a real story there and there's something that really happened there. Uh, and there was real feelings and real emotions and real worries and real fears. There was All the real was there as well. But this little maid says, And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord wherewith the prophet that is in Samaria for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, Naaman got some good news. What's the good news Naaman received? There's a man in Samaria that can heal me of my leprosy. Naaman had a lesson to learn. He had a lot of lessons to learn here in just a few minutes. Because just like in the Old and the New Testament, it talks about this is something you can't buy with money, you can't buy with prestige, uh, you can't buy with what you think you have. You're going to have to give your life for it. That's how you get it. You've got to give up your life to get it. You know, we all came to the Lord leprous. Raise your hand if you came to the Lord clean. We all came to the Lord leprous. We're all still trying to get some leprosy off of us. We're all still trying to get fully clean. And that's going to take place in the new man, the, the regeneration of our hearts and a new mind. And that's how that happens. So she said, the king of Syria said, go to go and I will send a letter unto the king. I said, let me drop back. And, the, and um, she said unto her mistress, Would the God my Lord uh, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus, and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver. And he goes on six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. There wasn't a price that Naaman wasn't willing to pay to get rid of his leprosy. At least he thought. At least he thought. And here he goes on and, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And look how the king thought in the next verse. The king thought, he goes, <laughs> and he brought the letter, and he said, Behold, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? <laughs> What's this king of Syria think? And then he goes on to say, See, I told you he had something against me. I told you he wanted to take me over. And it interests in the spirit of a king. thought that he was the one being asked to do the healing when he really wasn't. He was just sent a letter that they, this king of Syria wanted his servant healed. Then it goes on and says, 
He said, am I, um, am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send to, unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so that when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, I'm sure Elijah was probably thought, oh, why is he thinking he's got to take it upon himself? <laughs> he's not going to do it. And you know what Elijah knew? Elijah knew he wasn't going to do it either. The man of God wasn't going to do it. God was going to do it. He was going to use Elijah, but God was doing it. God did it. You know, God can do anything you need Him to do if you let Him do it. God can do anything you need Him to do if you let Him do it. In your own personal lives. There was something about Naaman that I'm going to get into here in just a little bit that it really, really touched my soul. I can so relate to Brother Naaman. Well, Brother Puckett, why are you calling him a brother? Because when Naaman left, Naaman left a brother. Naaman left a brother. Well, how do you know? Well, let's, we're going to finish reading. He goes on, he says, And when, and when it, so Elijah, the man of God, had heard the king had rent his clothes, and he sent the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let's see. How many of us come to church thinking that just coming to church is going to be enough to save us? How many of us think just coming here is going to get you saved? Because it's not. It's really not. Just being in church isn't enough. Just to have gone to church when I was a little isn't enough. Just to know about God isn't enough. There's a lot of people out there that know about God. A lot of people. There's a lot of us here that know about the Lord. We have a lot of knowledge of who He is and where He is and what he wants to do and what he can do, and that we have we have all that about him. But that's not what it takes. That's not enough. That's the beginning. Knowledge is the beginning of wisdom. But that's not enough. Naaman, it wasn't enough for Naaman to know. Naaman had some things he had to work through. He goes on, he says. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot. Now we're going to pause here just for a few minutes. You understand how great Naaman was. You understand, everyone, that he was the captain of the army of Syria. Understand Naaman didn't go anywhere alone. Understand that when Naaman pulled up to the prophet's house, there was an entourage of soldiers with him, chariots innumerable, and men of valor with him. Naaman, as the cartoon shows, just didn't pull up with just him and his servant on a chariot to the prophet's door. The ca captain of the army didn't go anywhere by himself. He had an entourage. How many times have I come to the Lord with my entourage? What I know, what I think I know, where I've been. How many times have I come to the Lord into His presence with my entourage around me to support me and to secure me from looking vulnerable or being vulnerable to any situation? Understand, Naaman was pulled into Samaria. He didn't know what enemy would be waiting for him. He didn't know what enemies were going to try to get him on the way there. He was Listen, I could tell you he probably had a big high price on his head. Wherever he went, there were men wanting to kill Naaman. Trust me. You don't get to be the captain of Syrian's army, the conqueror of the world, and not have a price on your head. <laughs> but Naaman wasn't worried. He had an entourage around him. You know, sometimes we come to church, we come to God's kingdom, we come into the presence of God, and we got an entourage. And we block God out with all of our knowledge that what we think we know. We like to quote what we know. We like to quote where we've been. We like to say where we've grown up or where we haven't grown up. We surround ourselves with all those things to protect us from what really has to happen. 
Understand Naaman, when he sat there at that door, that prophet, he was under a mindset. And the mindset was he's a leader, he's always been a leader, and he's always given orders. So when he pulled up to that prophet's house, he expected that prophet to walk out of there a little cowardly to him and do some kind of hocus-pocus over him in front of his soldiers in secrecy. The reason Naaman would rather that have happened is because it could have been a secret, private thing take place in Naaman's heart to get his healing. How many times would we rather just sit back on our pew and get what we need from God in a quiet manner? How many times would we like to just sit at home in our recliner and think we're just going to get from God in our privacy of our home so we don't have to be vulnerable to what it really takes to get what we need from God? And that's complete surrender. Naaman wasn't going to get what he wanted from God standing on that chariot. He wasn't going to get it. He wasn't getting it. As he stood outside that prophet's door, expecting that prophet to come out to the captain of the Syrian army. And, you know, could you imagine Gazi there sitting there thinking, looking out the window, and here goes the captain of the Syrian army. You know, you're, we already saw a story where he saw him get surrounded and thought, oh man, this is it. You imagine he pulled, looked out the window and he saw that entourage surrounding that man thinking, oh no, here it comes. There's another one here. That prophet, that man of God, was following the lead of the Lord. Following the lead of the Lord not the lead of Naaman. And to us, it may look kind of um, uh, uppity or snippity that Elijah would sit in his house. It's what we kind of say, you know, and Naaman kind of took it that way. But that wasn't it at all. I bet you Elijah was told to stay in, send your servant out, don't move. See, have you ever looked at that? Why did Elijah stay put? He'd laid on hands on people before. He'd been out before wandering around healing people. Why didn't he walk out there? There was something great there the Lord was trying to do. You know, out of all the leprosy in the Old Testament, I think Naaman was the only one healed of leprosy. You see, how many times do we have come to the Lord and we want to keep portions of our leprosy inside? And we want to stand in front of God's presence and demand God change us without any cost on my part. Without any cost on my part. Without any humiliation on my part. Can I tell you something? Do you know how humiliating it was? Because you can read how Naaman really thought, how, hum how angry he was, how humiliating it was for him to have that prophet not even grace his presence, not even come out to see him. How many times have we come to the Lord in need, in need, but demand, Lord, come meet me on my terms. Come meet me on my chariot. Come meet me in my place. I tell you, that's not the way you're going to get victory with the Lord. It's not the way I'm going to get victory with the Lord. I want to tell you, sometimes I've been sitting on my chariot and refusing to get off my chariot to get what I need from God. I wrote some things down real fast to give you. That chariot that Naaman rode in on was a picture. It was, do you know it was his boast? When Naaman rode up with an entourage and horses and chariots, do you, and a chariot, do you know it was his boast to all those around him who he was and what he has done? What he knows, who he knows, where he's been, how long he's been, it became his boast. Where he grew up in, what he didn't grow up in, what church he's from, what church he's not from, it became his boast. It was his boast. That chariot represents your boast. What are you boasting in this morning? Who are we boasting in this morning? A chariot is a picture of pride. <laughs> Naaman rolled up in his pride. Surrounding himself with his pride. And coming to the presence of the Lord and demanded to be able to keep my prideful condition. Be able to keep my prideful heart. Be able to keep my prideful stances. God, I demand you give me 
what I need from you. <laughs> you know, I've done that. <laughs> you know, I've been there. Have you been there? Are you there? How about that? Are you there now? Is there something you need from God, but you won't get off your chariot to get it? You know, we like to have a term in the world that they use, in, uh, off my high horse. <laughs> Got to get off my high horse to get what I need from God. Chariot sometimes are pride. How about our image? I don't want to look bad in front of nobody. I don't want to look like I need to go to the altar. If I go to the altar, you know what everybody's going to think? Well, Brother Puckett must be having some serious problems. He's got to go to the altar and get prayer. You know, it's a chariot. You know, it's a chariot if you refuse to go and get what you need from God. You're too boastful to get down. It's a pride. It's a chariot. My image is a chariot. I don't want anyone to think bad of me. I don't want any, I want everyone to think I got it all together. Naaman didn't want that 150 or more gathered around him to think he didn't have it all together. He didn't want them to think any less of him. That's why he was angry. He was angry when he was asked to do what he was asked to do. God doesn't come ask us to come standing up with our chest bowed out and our heads up high and demand him to save me. That's not what he asks. Matter of fact, I'm the, you know, our chariots are, I'm telling you something about this chariot. You better get this. I'm trying to get it myself. We better get this. Our chariots are hindering us from going on in God. Us standing on our chariots, our images, our pride. How about knowledge? How about knowledge? Knowledge can be my chariot. I can ride in here on knowledge. I can boast of what I know, tell you what I know. I can break everything down for you. I can tell you where I, all the things I've heard all my life. And stay on that chariot, Brother John, and never get what I need from God. I rode in on knowledge, or I rode in on an image, or I rode in in pride. Too exalted to get what I need from God. Too exalted to lower myself enough so God can help me. I've been there. I've been there. I'm going to tell you, I'll probably end up there again, Brother Scott. I'm telling you, we need what we need from God, and the only way to get it is get off my chariot. Another one is my family name. I might be a Puckett. And bless God, Puckets are spiritual. And I'll tell you all about the Puckett name. My boast is, not if I told you about the Puckett name, man, it is horrible. Let me just tell you. It's horrible. I thank God he opened my eyes to give at least somebody with the last name Puckett a chance in the future to go on in God. <laughs> but not to carry the name of Puckett, but to carry the name of Jesus on. I ain't boasting in being a Puckett. I'm boasting in being a Jesus. I ain't want to get right into my chariot of my last name. My last name is dirt to the Lord. It's nothing to the Lord. I'm trying to get a name changed. Are you trying to get your name changed? Sometimes our chariots is our names, who we are, where we are, what our names are, our long heritage of where we came from. I'll tell you where I came from. I came from a long heritage of a bunch of ungodly drunks. Most of them dead now. Not a one of them knew the Lord. <laughs> It don't matter where I came from. You don't need to hear where I came from. I'm just going to tell you who now. My, listen, I've got an inheritance. His name is Jesus. A lineage that's pure. A lineage that can take us on. That can take us on into perfection. I don't want to stay hooked up to my chariot of my name. How about a reputation? Well, I got a reputation to keep. I'm a strong man of God. Bless God. Strong man of God don't cry. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a this or I'm a that or I ain't, I'm strong willed. I ain't giving in to nobody. I'll tell you right now, that strong will is going to get me in trouble. Because if I ain't giving in to anybody, that means I ain't giving in to God either. But maybe on my terms, I give in to him. I might give in to him when he needs me. 
or when it benefits me in a greater way, I might yield. So I ask you, what chariot are you standing on today? What chariot did you ride in on? We need to be willing to get off our chariots and do it God's way. Do it God's way. When I came to this assembly, and again, I'm trying not to make it about me. Please mis don't misunderstand me. I can only draw from my own testimony. I could draw from things I've seen, but that's not my... I don't want to get in that realm. I'll get in the realm that I know for sure. I can point the finger at me when it's all said and done. When I first came to this assembly, I thought I knew something. After all, I did go to church when I was little. I did hear about Jesus. They preached about heaven, hell, all that. And when I got here, I started thinking in those thought processes when I started hearing Brother Finnegan preach. I was like, well, he's got that wrong. Well, he's got that wrong. Well, he's got that wrong. Why do we keep singing these songs over and over again? It's kind of crazy. He's got that wrong. You can sit here and think everything's wrong and pick it apart. You can. We all do. We all have. But until I got off that chariot and stepped down and concluded, I know nothing of this vision. I know nothing of this revelation. I know nothing of this God. I know nothing of this Savior. I know nothing of this Holy Ghost. I know nothing of this body of Christ. I had to step off my chariot and receive what God had for me. Had I stayed on that chariot 26 years ago, brother, I wouldn't be here today. How many of us have rode in on our chariots and we're still on our chariots? And we still can't get all that God has for us. In certain areas of our lives, we're still on our chariots. In other areas of our lives where it's benefited us, we've willfully got off of it. But then there's other areas where we step back up on our chariot and we can't get what we need from God because of it. It goes on, he says, And Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. You know what he was expecting, don't you? An instantaneous deliverance. You know, how many of us are sitting here in the kingdom of God and we're waiting for the instantaneous moment? I just change. It just happens. I just morph into a changed being. That's not the way it works. We've become a culture that's so used to just waiting to, for it to happen. You know, it takes something on our part to get God's full blessing in our lives. We have to do something. Just sitting and listening and hearing and gleaning and getting is not enough. I've got to be able, Brother Steve, to realize I'm on a chariot, number one. I've got to be able to see that. You know, you've got to be able to see what chariot you're standing on right now. As long as I'm on a chariot in any area of my life, I can't get the help God has for me. Naaman was standing there wanting an instantaneous deliverance from his condition. And he didn't want to look bad in front of nobody to get it. Because after all, I, I just said before, he didn't want to look weak, Brother John. His whole entourage was with him. What do you think they would, you know, in his mind, think about what Naaman was thinking. What are they going to think if they see me step down to this man of God, step down to what God's asking me to do? How weak is that going to make me look? <laughs> How weak will it look for me to step down off my chariot long enough to get what I need from God? Some of us are stuck in conditions in our lives because we're still on our chariots. And you have people around you trying to help you see that ain't much changed since you arrived to the house of God. 
Nothing changed for uh, Naaman when he just, just because he arose, arrived to the house of the prophet. Nothing changed for him just because he pulled up at the doorstep. Nothing changed for him just because he's standing near the presence of God. Nothing changed for Naaman right there. Nothing changed for him. How great it would be if I just walked in that door and I just changed instantly and I just got all I needed from God and it was done. How great that would be. I tell you, we wouldn't be able to stop the church being filled up if that's the way the kingdom of God worked. If that's the way the kingdom of God worked, we'd be full every Sunday. But like that song says, when that that bull comes in and he smells that burnt flesh. Get me out of here as soon as possible. Oh, no. Shut the door. <laughs> you know, I thank God. You know, I'll tell you something. I didn't shut my door when I came here. Do you know you need the Lord to shut the door on you? Do you know he gives you just enough? Think about the mercy and grace of God. He gave me just enough. To shut my door. I couldn't go. I couldn't get out. He shut the door on me. I thank God he shut the door on me. I thank God he closed that door. Now I could at any time. I can still any time go to that door. And open that door. And walk out. But I'll tell you something. I know the temptation's great. So I don't even go near the door anymore. How many times has the Lord wanted to shut the door for you so he could help you? And Brother John, I went right back to it and I opened that door and I got out of there before I had to die. I got out. Yet I tell you something, if you really have a vision and a revelation of where you're going and what God's doing, you're not going to want to get out of here. You're not going to want to get out. There'll be a time you'll want that door to stay shut and you'll beg God, nail it closed. Nail it shut. Bar the door. Because there's some strong man in me that if he ever gets a chance to get to that door again, he's getting out. He's getting out. I'm just hoping that I keep him barred long enough I can weaken him and kill him just enough he has no more fight in him. <laughs> you know, he has fight in him because we keep giving him the fight. We keep giving him what he needs to fight. We keep feeding that carnal mind. We keep feeding those carnal desires. We keep feeding those carnal ways. We give him the strength to defeat us. We give it the strength to keep us down. We give it the strength that we can't get the victories God has for us. We are giving it to it. It doesn't just happen. It dies if you don't feed your carnal nature. It dies. You gotta lay the sword of the spirit to it daily, as it was said in a testimony. Daily, get the manna from heaven. Daily, get that manna. Daily, sharpen that sword. Daily, fight that fight of faith. Daily. So then Naaman, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Listen here. We, for those that don't know, listen what the prophet told him. He said, I will heal. The Lord will heal you. He will heal you. You will be healed. If. He says, if. You go down to the Jordan seven times and I flesh shall come again unto thee and thou shalt be clean. Now, isn't it funny? God gives us exactly how to get ourselves right. He gives us exactly how to get our lives straight. He gives us exactly how to get our lives going in a successful direction to make it to heaven. And he tells us exactly what to do and how to do it and get it done. And he says, Sister Adela, if we do it, we'll be clean. How many times have we sat in service upon service and heard things that we know if we do it, we'll be clean? We leave complaining about it. Upset about it. Why did, listen, Naaman left on his chariot in anger. He was on his chariot when he left. That means he didn't get off his chariot. I believe he stood there at the front door of that house and never, I, just, I'm, I'm reading in between the lines, of course. 
But Sister Savannah, I look at Naaman pulling that chariot up real sideways and parking that thing and standing on that chariot at that front door waiting for that man of God to come out to him. Waiting. I don't think he got off his chariot right there. I really don't. I think he left angry because he stayed on his chariot. He stayed in whatever condition God was trying to get him out of. He wanted to stay on that condition. But thank God Naaman saw something. He, he gave God a chance. Think about that. You know, you've got to give God a chance. You know, if your way has been a wreck all your life, isn't it safe to say give God a chance? If your way is not producing what you need, isn't it safe to say give God a chance? You know, I've only, listen, Oh, anyone in here, you've only gotten better because you gave God a chance in the areas of your life you've been better in. That's it. That's it. Brother Finnegan told us years ago, if I've always do what I've always done, I will always be what I've always been. And when he said that's a definition of what? Insanity. Insanity. I don't want to be insane. I'll tell you the truth. I've been insane. I don't want to. I want to look back in the areas of my life and see what it isn't produced the fruit and I want to do whatever it takes to get that fruit there. And thank God, like, he's a God of not just second, uh, what's it, second chances. He's the God of third chances, four chances, fifth chances, six chances, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. He's the God of all those chances, but can I tell you what he is? He's a God that's going to shut the door one day. He's a God that's going to shut the door to the bride one day. So he'll give you all the chances you want, but remember, the door's closing. So yes, he's going to give you all the opportunities. Listen, he doesn't waste his time. Do you understand everyone in this room is here because God didn't have nothing else better to do? Is that why we're here? Because God didn't have nothing else better to do? I mean, he was up there. He's got all eternity, brother. I mean, after all, he's got to do some things that's fun, right? God doesn't waste a moment of what he's done. He doesn't make, waste a person and who he's trying to help. He ain't wasting the time to help us. He's trying to help us. He's helping us, isn't he, sister? He's helping us. But we got things we got to do. So Naaman, he goes on. Elijah sent him a message and washed seven times and thy flesh come again and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. He was angry and went away and said, and here's the key words, behold, I thought. Isn't there a scripture about that? My thoughts aren't your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, thus saith the Lord. Naaman was still stuck in the mindset, I thought. He wasn't yielding that over yet to the Lord. He wasn't yielding his mind over yet. He wasn't giving his thoughts to the Lord. I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. You think about that? It's like, come here, Naaman. Here's what he wanted. Stand up, Naaman. Here's what he was saying. Naaman wants the man to healed. You're healed. That's what Naaman wanted. He wanted that strike of that hand. He wanted that healed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. That's what he wanted. Man, God knows exactly what he's doing, doesn't he? Man, doesn't he know how to get right down to the heart of the matter? It wasn't, listen, Naaman's leprosy was just an easy fix for God. And just like Naaman said, all the prophet had to do was like, say out of his mouth in that house, just say the words, be healed. And I'll tell you, Naaman would have been healed. That's how easy it is for God to heal the leprosy. But there was something much greater inside Naaman that was, God was trying to get to. <laughs> Man, he was really, he wasn't worried about the outward at all. God could care less about Naaman's outward leprosy. God wanted to change Naaman's heart. That's what he wanted. That's what he wants. You know, God doesn't care about our outward appearances. He wants to change our hearts. 
And if you change the hearts, the rest comes with it. Look, Naaman needed to get his heart right before he pulled up to that Jordan. Do you know that? He had to go through this process of being angry and wroth before he could see something. And that servant there in his ear, you know, if he had asked you to have done something really great, wouldn't you have done it? Sometimes we think God should ask us to do something great, like just, just let me go up there and somebody lay hands on me and it's done. Don't ask me to pour my heart out on the altar four, five, six days, seven days, or a week, or a month, or a year, or whatever it takes. Don't ask me to be that humiliated in front of everybody. Just give me that secret instant healing that I need. You know the root word of humiliating or humiliation is humble. Do you know Naaman was humiliated at that prophet? He was humiliated that you would even ask him to go get in that dirty, stinking, nasty river and that you didn't have enough gall to come out to me face to face and wave your hand over me and heal me. Don't you know who I am? And don't think those thoughts did not know, even though it ain't on his page, don't think those thoughts did not go through Naaman's head because they did. God didn't care about Naaman's leprosy, brother Ethan. He wanted Naaman's heart. That's what he cared about. And he goes on and he said, and we'll strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Far for a river of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Now look, see, he still wanted to keep his stature and his pride. He still wanted to keep his dignity. Yeah. You know, because the Lord could have told him to go to any of those rivers close to his home, anywhere he lived. Now I know there's other types and pictures in here, but he picked this river. It was dirty. Oh, man. Naaman was asked to get into a dirty river. This... He probably ain't had a he probably had a shower any time he demanded, probably two or three times a day he wanted one. If he wanted one, he just said, I want a shower. They surrounded him, threw the shower above him, they washed him. He didn't even have to wash himself, probably. He probably had it all taken care of. You want me to go get in that dirty river? Are you kidding me? Man, this guy just don't got a clue. And he says, see here, he's still fighting for his way of doing it. See, how many times do we still fight God for our way of doing it? Naaman was still resisting God's way and wanting his way to get it done. He said, so better than all the waters of Israel, may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. That's some strong words there. I mean, he probably was very tempted to say, burn the house down. I mean, you know, if he was that rage, you don't know what he was thinking. But they did have a fear of the prophet. They did understand God's men. They did understand that. But see, again, Naaman's way would have been a cleaner rivers. Left, so I didn't lose any stature. So I could still look good in front of everybody. But listen, his ways are not our ways. He knows exactly how to get us in the condition we need to be in to get what we need from God so we can go on into eternity. And the more we resist those things, then we're just prolonging the inevitable. I'm going to miss out. I'm going to miss out. And his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldn't thou not hast done it? You know why that would have been? Because the glory would have been given to Naaman. If it was a great thing, Naaman would have got some of that glory. Can I tell you something? God's going to ask us to go to a place where we're not getting the glory for any of this. We're not getting the credit for any of this. He's going to take us to a place in our lives if we let him that only he's going to get the glory and it can only be said, if not but by God, I would not be here today. not going to have an army full of pull ourselves up by our own bootstrap type of people. He's just not. He's going to have an army full of people that's going to say, but by the grace of God, so was I. So was I. But by the grace of God. Because it gets a little bit deeper here. This story is pretty big. I tell you. 
I was enjoying it. And he goes on, he says, And his servant came and spake, What great thing, would thou not have done it? How much rather than when he had saith unto thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down. Now, here it is, right here. Then went he down. Down from where? You know, I used to always picture that as down the bank. He went down the bank to the Jordan River. I'm going to tell you something. He went down off his chariot. He got down. He reduced. He got to a place in his mind he was ready to reduce himself down. Ha, thank God, you know. <laughs> thank God. Look, we all need to get to that place where we're willing to reduce ourselves down. Sometimes it takes us time. Look, it took the ride from the prophet's house to the Jordan River for Naaman to get into the mindset that I have to reduce myself down to get what God has for me. <laughs> and he wasn't getting it any other way. Elijah didn't give him a plan B and said, well, by the way, if you don't like the River Jordan, just go over here and shake this bush three times and kick the stump and you'll be healed. He didn't get a second opportunity or a second chance. He didn't get an other option. You know, we've only got one option, church. And that's his way. And that's it. As Brother Dave said when he was here, any other way is a thief. And a robber. We got one option. That's his way. I'm not making it to heaven my way. So here. What a beautiful picture. He went down. Now you got to understand this picture now. Don't just picture this name and stepping off his chariot and walking down to the river. Because that's not what happened. Let's, let's dig into it just a little bit deeper here. Naaman was dressed in his war apparel when he showed up at Elijah's house. Do you know that? He came in kingly garments. He came with kingly helmet. He came in full battle array to boast who he was. Well, how do you know that, Brother Puckett? He was the captain of the army. He wasn't dressing down for anybody. He doesn't dress down. So when Naaman decided to get off that chariot, that helmet had to come off. Everything that was protecting him from God had to come off. He had to set his knowledge aside of what he thinks he knows, what he thought he knew, and put that aside because he was about ready to get a new understanding. I understand that priestly garment that he was wearing, that big robe with the gold intertwined in there and all those colors, he had to get that thing. He was derobing. I don't break the microphone. He was derobing right there at that bank. You know, the Lord's asked us to come and derobe. Get out of ourselves and get in Jesus. We've got to derobe. We're not going to be able to go on in God and keep our same old apparel. He would derobe. You think about this. Look at the picture there for a minute. Man, name it. Thank God. I tell you. He took off all that priestly garment. No, not priestly, I'm sorry, that fleshly garment. He took off that war apparel. All that natural victories he's had, all that success in his life, his image, everything he thought he was, everything that identified who he was. Do you know when he wore that robe, anybody that saw that robe coming could identify that's the captain of the Syrian army. Do you know you got to set your identity down? We got to lay down who we think we are. We got to lay down who we think we've been all of our lives. We got to set that all aside. Derobe ourselves to God and make ourselves vulnerable to the Lord. And let him know, I don't want my old woolen garments anymore. I don't want that old identity anymore. I don't want to be who I used to be anymore. I want to be different. And that Syrian captain and that army there, he... Man, can you imagine what those men were thinking? I'm going to tell you what they were thinking. He's done lost his mind. 
He's done lost his mind. Brother John, he stepped down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Let's go ahead and magnify that a little bit. Do you know? Well, Brother Puckett, how long do I do it? How long do I keep giving up myself? How long do I keep fighting back? The thing? Well, until it's complete. Until it's finished. Seven times. The number seven is the number of completion. You just do it until the job's done. How many times do we want to just dip once and think that's enough? Well, I'm here. I'm here. At least I'm here. Isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. Naaman was there right at the prophet's door. It wasn't enough just to be there. There was a whole process Naaman had to get ready to go through in order to get healed from the leprosy he was covered in at this point. Do you understand when sin like leprosy takes over, it starts to take over the whole person? Do you know sin, as little as you might think it is or as much control as you think it is, it's taken over your whole being and all the while you think you've got victory over it? Because after all, I can stop anytime I want. Really? Why haven't you? Why haven't I? I feel like I'm in Honduras. I don't know. Somewhere I've got my jacket on, but I hope this ain't offending anybody. I just take too much time to put it on. I don't got my time frame here. But how many times we want to come? <laughs> I've been here. I'm telling you, I've been here. <laughs> I just want to give just enough. No more than I feel that I need to give. I just want to give enough. And after all, shouldn't this be enough for me to give? I'm here. Shouldn't name it and say, well, at least I've done it once. That's enough. Shouldn't that be enough if I just do it one time? <laughs> why do I need all these extras at it? I'll tell you why you need all the extras God has. Because without all the extra times, I'm not going to make it. I need all that extra stuff God's trying to give me. <laughs> when I read that... <laughs> Man, my heart left for Naaman when he stepped off that chariot. <laughs> Man, he was going in the right direction. You know, when you step off the chariot, you're going in the right direction. If you don't get off that chariot, you're just going to go right back to where you were and you're going to die a leper. Understand, if Naaman didn't choose to get off that chariot, Savannah, he would have went all the way back home and died a leper died in the condition he came to the presence of God to get delivered from. We all came to the presence of God to get delivered from a condition. We all are here to get delivered from our condition, but I'm going to tell you something. If I don't get off my chariot, I'm not getting the deliverance of God. And I'll, if I stay on that chariot, I'm just going to ride right back to where I came from and I'll die a leper. Some people would find it easier to go into a battle at war and give me an AR-15 or an M-16 or whatever it takes and I'll go in that battle and I'll pick up that gun and I'll shoot the other soldiers as many times as I need. I'll fight for my life. What life? My spiritual life? No, my natural man. I'll fight for my natural life to make sure I stay alive. I'll fight for my buddy's life. I'll take a bullet for my buddy. Bless God, don't ask me to fight for my spiritual life and don't ask me to fight for my sons, my daughters, my family. Don't ask me to do that because I'm not willing to do that. It'd be much easier for you to ask me to go to war and fight a natural war than it would be for you to ask me to go and fight this spiritual war that Naaman had to fight. And don't think Naaman did not fight that battle from the time he left Elijah's house to the time he got to that river. There was a battle raging inside of Naaman. And every horse he heard behind him was just one more reason not to do it. Every time he looked around and saw all those men following him was just another reason not to do it. He pulled up to that Jordan River. He stepped off that chariot, brother. And he got down in that water seven times. As much as it takes to get fixed, I'll do it. Will you do it? Will you do it as much as it takes to get fixed? Do you really want to be fixed that bad? Do I really want to get fixed that bad that I'll do whatever it takes to get fixed? There's times that he's asked me to do things I said no. There's times he's told me to do things I resisted it. <laughs> I've got to 
I tell you something? Naaman stepped down off that chariot, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. The man of God was trying to tell Naaman how to get healed from his condition. This is why it's important to have a ministry church. They are trying to get from God what we need to go on in God. And they're trying to get the equipment for us. Now that you're not getting your own equipment, don't misunderstand me. We're up here sharing the load of trying to get equipment for everybody. And we're trying to give you the equipment to try to get you to a place that you'll get off your chariot. You'll derobe who you are. You'll take the walk of shame. Do you know something? Naaman took a walk of shame to his old man. Nobody thinks about that. I didn't think about that. Maybe y'all did. Maybe I'm just that far behind the curve. But I'm going to tell you, Brother Scott, to just give one inclination that he was going to be submissive to the man of God and su submit himself. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And under the realization that all his entourage is watching him, the moment he pulled up to that Jordan River, his walk of shame started. How many times is just like a picture of that person back at the pew struggling to come to the altar? Yeah, yeah. nobody wants to. We always say, well, you, so we used to say this. I hope we still do. I don't know. We used to say, well, somebody come up to the altar. Maybe it'll make it easier for others to come up to the altar. Remember that? Why? Because let me tell you something. It's a hard walk to walk when you realize you've been wrong. It's a hard walk to walk to realize I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. You know, everything in us wants to look like we're together. We're held together. We got it all together, right? We want that appearance. We want that chariot. And that chariot might be, well, brother so-and-so, brother Scott's got it all together. And brother Scott's riding that chariot because everyone thinks brother Scott's got it together. Oh, you might have it together. I'm not, sorry. But all the while, you know, I don't have nothing together. Oh, my goodness. But you know what? I'm riding on that chariot and I refuse to get off that chariot because I know the moment I get off that chariot, there's a walk of shame that's got to take place. I got to walk down to that river and tell. Let me tell you something. That was very humiliating to Naaman. Yeah, it was very humiliating to him. And he said he went down, dipped himself as the man of God. Flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God. And he, he and all his company. There's his company, by the way. There they are. There's his entourage. He had a company with him, brother. There was a big company too. Understand, he did it in front of all those watching him. Listen, he said, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth. <laughs> he came to an understanding of Elisha's God. There is no other God in all the earth. Listen to what he says here. But in Israel, now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, as the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. Go back, I think it's Matthew 20. Uh, what's the scripture? Matthew 10. Somewhere in Matthew 10, where it says in verse 8, what you freely give or receive freely give. And that's what Elijah was saying here. I don't take nothing for this. It was freely given to me. I'm going to freely give it back to you. I don't need payment for this. It wasn't mine to give you anyway. It belonged to the Lord. And he said, receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thee two mules burned of earth? You know, I didn't understand. I was reading this. Do you understand what he said? To, he said to the prophet right there, Naaman was saying to Elisha, will you give me two loads of dirt? <laughs> will you give me two loads of dirt? And I'm thinking, well, what does the world does that mean? Naaman understood he was standing on holy ground and he couldn't take Syria to Israel, but bless God, he could take part of Israel back with him. And he was going to truck that dirt back to his home again. And he made a proclamation. He said, And Naaman shall say, I be pray thee, given thy servant to mules burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth and offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifices to unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Listen, Naaman was saved. He got a revelation. He was birthed. And listen, he got a revealing of who God was. You 
know you get a new birth and revealing of who God is when you just follow God's pattern to get yourself saved. And he goes on, he says, because this gets really interesting. I'm going to finish up here in a second. I know we're going to have a meal. I thought that was a good way to say, hey, can I have two loads of dirt before I go? Sure. The prophet was like, yeah, absolutely. Take you two loads of dirt if that'll help you. And this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when thy master goeth into the house of Remen to worship there, that he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself into the house of Remen. When I bow down in the house of Remen, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Now, you got a picture there when, of a, the, the man of God, the ministry there of Elisha that didn't want credit for anything. They didn't want credit for it. But then there was another one here. But Gazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian, is not receiving at his hands that which he brought, but as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well. And here you had this ministry, Gazi's ministry. He wanted some credit for that. You know, the moment he did that, you know why the leprosy fell on Gazi? Because Gazi just took the glory from God and put it on man. And he said, and Naaman said, Be content, verse 23, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver, two bags with two changes of garments, and laid them upon his servants. And they bare them before him. And when he had came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elijah said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gazi? <laughs> and he said, Thy servant went no." Whither? Nowhere. I didn't go anywhere. What are we talking about? Who, me? I didn't do nothing. What do you mean? And he said, and he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? It is a time to receive money and, and, time, and to receive garments. And is it time, I'm sorry, is it time to receive money and receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and auction and men serve? Is, is it time to say it's me? Is it time to claim the job as your own? No. That's not the time it is. This isn't going to be done, but only by the Lord, church. Yes, he's going to use men of God. Yes, he's going to use the ministry. But he's doing the work. He's doing the work. And the moment Gazi took payment, he was telling the king of Sy the, the captain's army there, we did that work. We deserve to get paid for that, right? And he said, and I'm sure it broke Elisha's heart. Turned again from the church, sheep, oxen, and men, servants, and mason. And the leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. And listen, not unto thee only, to the generations forever. Forever. And he went out his presence as a leper, as white as snow. Listen, to God be the glory. Let God work a work in you that he's trying to work. Let God do what he brought you here to do. There's things he wants to do for you, for your life, not just for you and for your life, but for your children, your children's children, and any other child to come after you. Do you understand what God's plan and what he's trying to do for us, Brother Eddie? But in order for that to happen, it doesn't do good enough to just show up at the house of God. It doesn't do enough. It's not enough to just show up. It wasn't enough for Naaman just to pull up at that door. After all, haven't we all pulled into the here? Haven't we all pulled in? We've all pulled in here. We've all come in. It's not just enough to come in. But whatever the process God's trying to tell you to do, you need to do it in order to get cleansed from the condition we're in. 
If I want to be clean, I have to follow the process that God has put in place. That means I might be angry after I hear it because I'm going to tell you there some things I heard that I didn't like. There was things I heard preached when I first came around I didn't like it. <laughs> but I thank God by the mercy and grace of God not by my own will, not by my own might, nor by my strength. Man, he coaxed me off that chariot. <laughs> he wooed me off my chariot, Brother Davis. He wooed me off my chariot. He still wooed me off my chariot. He's still trying to get me off. There's places in my life I'm still standing on a chariot. He wants us off our chariots. He wants us out of our image and our reputation what people think about us or not think about us. He wants all that gone. He wants to get us to a place that when anyone sees us, they see Him. That's where we're going, church. If you need something from God, understand God has everything you need. He has it. He will not force it on you. He will not force you to follow and be obedient to him he won't do it he could but he won't and what he wants from us is our willingness to get off our chariots derobe ourselves of who we think we are and submit to who he is and do it his way god bless y'all
anybody, I mean this, anybody in this room, whether you've been born again and need to recommit yourselves, or whether you haven't been born again, whether you haven't asked the Lord into your heart, whether you haven't made that commitment, or you made the commitment one time and you've gone back, or two times and gone back, can I tell you something? The Lord is open. He's open to receive you and forgive you and help you start afresh. But see, just like Naaman, we have to come off our chariots and we have to walk that walk. God bless y'all. Yeah.